Thank you so much, Ashley. And, and thank you for um, allowing me the opportunity to share some information on lamb and, and competing meat markets. Um, much of which you will have seen in other market situation reports, but um, I'm hoping that some of the information is a bit more up to date from, from what you may have seen previously. Um, we will look at what has happened globally um, and then in, take a look at the US market and then bring it closer to home, um, you know, to better prepare us for having a discussion as to where we feel this may lead. Um, as Ashley said, I'm, I'm with um, agriculture and irrigation um, and I have been the livestock market analyst um, since spring of this year. So I am relatively new to the area, but I have worked in industry for, for several years. <clears throat> um, today's agenda is going to look at, as I said, uh, looking at the, at the broader picture and bringing it down, narrowing it down to the provincial um, situation. And what I'd like to do as well is, is hopefully we have some time to kind of encourage you to contribute some comments and, and insights as, you know, as, as to your perspectives for the challenges that are, are facing your industry. Now, according to the International um, wool and textile organization, global production has been expanding. The world sheep numbers rose to a record of a 1.266 billion head in 2021. This represents about a 16.9% increase since 1995 and about a 0.3% uh, increase over 2021 20, over 2020. Now, the, the growth in, in sheep numbers between 2009 and 2019 was in response to an extended period of high prices and, and demand for sheep meat. Um, world ovine meat output in 2021 reached 16.4 million tons, which was up 1.8% year over year. Now, if we look at the top producing countries, we see China is a major player. Um, China represents about 14% share of the world's sheep population. And since 1995, its increase in, in sheep numbers has risen by 46.3%. 2021 increase over 2020 was 4.4%. And, and um, that increase was attributed in part to entry of smaller scale producers. And um, this, this occurred in part because of the lower uh, pig meat production, and also because previous year's high prices in sheep. India and Australia have the second and third largest numbers of sheep and increased in 21 over 20 by two and 2.5% and, uh, respectively. This increase in Australia <clears throat> followed a couple of years of decline due to drought. Um, between the years of 2001 and 2009, in Australia was, was one of the, the most severe droughts. Um, uh, they termed it the millennium drought. To, um, 2022 sheep meat production is forecast to increase by 1.4% um, to 361 million tons. Now, if we take a closer look, at the production, we're, we're gonna look at some information, but for comparative purposes, 
it's based off of 2019. Um, we see that China is also um, a large meat importer. And the African swine fever related um, meat supply gap that was created has continued to support high volumes of imports to China. Production growth, you'll note in, in this first production graph, the uh, in my screen it's orange, is, is the sheep meat production and the gray bars represent the domestic consumption. So if we're, if we're looking at Australia and New Zealand, um, there you see the surplus production that, that gives them the export potential. Um, I'd, I'd like to note that, you know, relative to um, Australia and New Zealand, they more recently in the last year or so, 2021, had been having some experiences that were kind of COVID related with shipping delays and high freight costs. Um, by way of comparison, in terms of meat exports, Australia in 2019, well, based on the 2019 data, exported 431,000 tons. Um, New Zealand was close behind with 386,000 tons. And lamb comprised about 61 and 78% respectively of those exports. Now, according to Sheep Centr Central out of Australia, the ewe flock is continuing to grow. It's, it's up about uh, 717,000 ewes since October of last year. And it's, it's suggested that, this that they can handle this increase in demand um, because they're targeting the markets of Japan, US, India, Indonesia, and China. Um, so they're, they're, they've really developed the, the strength for, for that component. New Zealand, however, is, is uh, reported to currently be facing a little bit more competition for its pasture land from, from the beef and, and the dairy sectors. <clears throat> now this, I wanted to share this graph that um, was developed by the Organization for Economic uh, Cooperation and Development. It's, it's showing the, the um, meat price index which is computed um, as an average price of, of four meats, um, the poultry, bovine, pig, and ovine. And it's, it's, it's um, computed as the average prices of those meats um, weighted by the world export trade shares. Now, you may note, um, it, it looks at an average from 2012 to 2001 as, as, as setting the base of 100. And the meat prices, we will note, has have the upward trend um, in 2021. And that's reflecting the, the high demand, um, what, what, is, what is attributed to kind of an economic recovery and, and also the higher marketing and transport costs. But um, what I'd like you to keep in mind as we proceed through our, our uh, discussions as well is, yes, there has been the, the higher meat prices, but um, rising feed costs have also put some pressure on the profitability side. Now, the agricultural demand growth is expected to slow down, uh, according to OEA, OECD, um, in the next <clears throat> decade. Um, now, the demand both in, in this last decade and the decade forward um, is driven primarily by population growth. And, um, the, the lower annual 
growth rate going forward is is said to be um, attributed primarily to uh, a slowdown in demand in China and with middle income uh, countries. Now, if we take another look at at those, um, you know, look look at those meat price indices, global meat price indices. Um, the this dark line is uh, the 2020 index, um, and the 2021 is this blue one. I'm hoping you can see my cursor, but <laughs> and the the uh, dotted line is is 2022. And I think you would be able to see from this map from approximately, you know, the upward trend from approximately October of 2020 through to a high of May of, of 2022. And this again, there, as, as we'd indicated, was, was um, uh, attributed to, to tighter supplies um, from the leading exporting countries and, and strong import demand from Asia and, and Middle East. Um, if we look at a, at a little bit of a, a longer time frame, 2005 to 2022, um, we'd, we'd see not only the black line, which was our, our meat index, but the, the meat index for each uh, respective uh, meat, uh, poultry, beef, uh, pig meat, and, and sheep meat. And I think what I'd, I'd like to um, address or, or, or look at here is, is there seems to be a bit of an inflection point in 2016. Um, prior, they, there were uh, large supplies, uh, record stocks, strong dollar, falling oil prices that put pressure on pricing, meat pricing. And um, there were also weaker demands from, from some of the emerging economies. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, my throat's a little sore. <laughs> um, there, there are a couple of aspects that really influence some of the meat prices. Um, one, as, as we've said with the African swine fever, the, the animal disease um, events or outbreaks, and similarly, trade policies. Now, uh, specifically rel relative to trade policies, um, such as the Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, that was ratified in, in 2018. Um, it it's causes, uh, you know, uh, uh, a period of, of increase and, and diverse, diversifies uh, the meat trade. Um, we also had <clears throat> trade agreements between Australia and Indonesia in July of 2020 um, between for, for the Europe, uh, European Union in, in December of 2020 with the UK. Um, and uh, UK and Japan agreement, I believe that was in November of 2020. So those, those uh, agreements help, help bolster um, trade relations and, and demand. Um, but there are also events such as the, um, in, in 2015, there was the International Agency for research in cancer, um, which kind of classified processed meats as carcinogenic. This is this is also um, suggested to to have caused a lot of consumers um, to to concerns with consumers, and 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 it may have impacted uh, some of the consumption and, and per per capita meat consumption. Um, at, in that period. Now, looking a little closer at the sheep meat index, um, 
Again, the, the dashed line here is 2022. Um, the the um, nominal sheep meat prices are expected to remain low, uh, partly due to the weak, as we said, the demand from China uh, of late and, and, and uh, Middle East. Um, and the higher lamb production out of Australia. <clears throat> now, I also wanted to, to quickly look at uh, meat consumption by different regions across, across the world. Um, well, these, these projections for the next decade uh, out of the OECD, um, have certain assumptions um, that in terms of COVID-19 and animal diseases that they're kind of normalized in, in a near short term and that there wouldn't be uh, future shocks from feed grain prices. So we need to, to kind of keep in mind that um, we've actually seen prolonged pandemic and slow economic recovery and, and outbreaks from animal disease shot markets and, and, and take years to recover. But I, th I think although it may reflect a more optimistic view of the next 10 years, it still captures um, a, a good comparison. Um, so looking at it regionally, I think, I think when we look at poultry meat consumption, it's it's strong across all the regions. Um, this is this has been you know attributed to to uh, you know lower being lower priced. Um, it has a product consistency and and it's it's has a higher protein to fat content, which is is viewed as as desirable by the consumers. The Pig meat consumption has been stagnant over the de decade primarily, although it remains strong in Europe. Um, there are several Asi Asian countries that um, are projected to increase consumption. In terms of the beef consumption, it's expected to decline over the next decade. Um, the Asian Pacific is it, and Pacific are, are the only regions where per capita consumption may increase. So when we look at sheep consumption, <clears throat> they're stated to, you know, the, the analysis suggests that they're considered still a niche market in many of the regions. And um, also as a, as a premium um, component in some of the di diets of others. Now, um, we're traditionally consumed in areas like the Near Eastern or the North African countries. It may have a, a longer term slow decline. And, and I just want to touch on, on uh, wool production. Like overall, the, the total world availability of wool has, has increased about 3% in 2021. It's, it's expected to rise again in 2022 uh, by 1.3%. Australia remains the largest wool producing country in the clean weight terms. Um, and, and China is, is still the, the largest in terms of the greasy weight. Uh, terms. Now, the Greece wool production in, in greasy weight terms fell slightly in 2021. And uh, this is this is kind of a continued downward trend since 2015. Now, getting closer to home, we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at the at the US market. <clears throat> and I think one one key that I, I want to put here is that we have to recognize that much of Western US was plagued by drought conditions. Um, 
for almost three years. And, and in August of 2022, nearly 30% of the pasture and range conditions were rated as poor or very poor. Um, Southern Plains were, were rated as, as nearly 50%. So, you know, it, it, it definitely presented a lot of challenges for, for production. Now, the National Agricultural Statistical Services of USDA, um, they provide a, an annual snapshot of, of sheep and lamb inventories um, as of the first, as of January 1st each year. And if, if we um, look to that information, we, we see that January 1st of 2022 totaled 5.07 million head. This was down 2% <clears throat> uh, over, over uh, 2021. Now that two, that was also felt, the 2% percent, percent, uh, decrease was also felt in, in uh, the breeding, stock, uh, breeding sheep inventory. Uh, it, it was 3% in the market sheep and lamb. And um, I'd say in their inventory information, um, the market lambs comprised about 94% of the total market inventory and, and the market sheep were approximately 6% of the market inventory. Sheep slaughter, um, commercial slaughter was at about 2.26 million head. It was up in 2021 from the previous year uh, with the federal inspected component was about 85.1% of the total. Um, average live weight was down three pounds uh, from, from 2020 at, at 122 pounds. And, and um, it's also reported by USDA that the lamb and yearlings comprised 92.7% of the total federally inspected sheep slaughter. Now, um, the, there's also an indication that from January through August, the lamb zone feed showed significantly higher volumes. And this was, this was reported through the Livestock Marketing Information Center. Um, that would indicate that there was a bit of a backlog in live lambs, um, but more recent data is suggesting that this backlog that there may have been an improvement in, in slaughter pace and, and the backlog is easing. The, the Livestock uh, Market Information Center is forecasting sheep and lamb slaughter to be down 4.7% and 1.4% respectively for the third and fourth quarter of this year, um, which, you know, is is um, more is higher rate than what the USDA have have projected, and I think I think um, you may have seen some of this information as well that the the uh, total production from the US is about five point two million head of sheep and lamb. Um, the top 10 states are reported here. The, you'd note that there's roughly, you know, the top three are Texas, California, and, and Colorado. Approximately 25% of the lambs um, are in Texas and California. Now, <clears throat> this 5.2 million, I'd, I'd say it it's, compares to our, our Canadian inventory of of 1.077 million head. Alberta inventory was about 233,000, which would place us in, in kind of the range of, of between Idaho and, and Montana uh, production base. Now looking at, at um, information reported through 
uh, Livestock Marketing Information Center. Uh, an average of, of the Colorado, uh, South Dakota, and Texas uh, pricing quarterly. Um, You'll, you'll note the volatility, especially more recently. Um, and of course, the significant downturn in the lamb market recently. Now, um, there has also been a, a reported increase in lamb and yearling weights. And, and what what uh, the Livestock Market Information Center has indicated is it's, it's up to eight pounds compared to last year. So that that's a, a substantial increase. Um, I'm, I'm just going to comment last week, um, the the price was reported at um, 128.21 US dollars per hundred weight. That was down 4.5% uh, from last week. And, and it's like 20.9% lower than the five-year average. Um, now, there, there, there's also more lambs on, on feed versus last year, as, as, as we commented earlier. But I think that they were showing that by end of August, it, it was nearing the five-year averages. So it seemed that they seemed to be working through the, the backlog. Information on, on the quarterly cutout um, shows, shows that, um, you know, Approximately, you know, the height, the height, I'd say, of, of the peak in the cutout was in December 2021. And uh, that rise started back in September of 2020. I'm trying to see if my cursor is, doesn't move too fast. Um, but they're experiencing a, a sharp downturn as well. And um, the, the one thing that has been commented is, is if these if if this materializes into a, a lower retail price, um, then it then it could have a favorable impact on demand. If we look at consumption, um, the lamb and, and mutton consumption it's it's obviously a um, or it is a a small component relative to to other meats um, the 2020 per capita consumption was reported uh, by by LMIC as uh, 1.4 pounds for 2020 um, consumption shows shows um, significant growth though in in 2020 and 2021 now um, some of this has been attributed to a bit of um, you know initially with the onset of of uh, covid 19 there there was a you know um, Kind of a more time, you know. People people were working from home more. It, there, there's um, it, it's presumed that that um, there was more time for for preparing meals. Um, people may have been wanting to try some different different meats as well. So that initial component did did see an increase in demand. Um, then again, uh, as, as the uh, people went back to work um, and time became less uh, available for, for 
prep food preparation, it's believed that that had an impact on, on consumption and demand as well, uh, as we see a decline in the, in the demand. But the, the remainder of this decline um, is attributed primarily to, you know, from, from the inflation. Um, we see that inflation began to rise in 2021 as, as uh, identified by the consumer price index of all, of all items. And it continued to rise at an increasing rate through 2022. <clears throat> now, banks um, like the Bank of Canada have, have increased interest rates to try and curb some of that inflation. Um, but the CPI is, you know, Bank of Canada's is still projecting um, that there would be a, a 3% um, inflation by in, still within 2023, and that uh, it, it'll be um, 2024 before they see a return to what they would consider more normal rates of 2% in interest rates. Now, I, I wanted to, to share this um, map as well, because it, it reflects the, the location of lamb and sheep slaughter facilities across US. Now, there are 905 plant slaughter, uh, slaughtering under federal inspection as of January 1st, 2022. Um, this was up from, from 858 the, the prior year reported. 534 plants slaughter sheep and lamb in 2021. Um, and I've, I've pointed out a couple here that, I, that I've um, heard about through the press. One, one being, you know, in, in California, the, in um, Dick, Dixon, California, um, Superior Farms. It's, it's uh, a fairly large um, state-of-the-art facility. And within Colorado, there's, there's a couple of larger facilities as well, one in Denver and one in Brush um, that I, I thought are warranted uh, identifying where they're located. I, th I think what I found interesting when I looked at this map is, is also when you look at Say the north um, to northwest, you know, uh, component of the states. Typically, that has about forty-five percent of of the U population, and the north central would have about twenty-four percent. They may have changed. These are a couple of days, a couple of years, but uh, prior information I had, but but they'd still be reflective of, of the point I'm trying to make. The, the Eastern component is 12% is of the U population and you know, Texas and, and, and the, the South Central, oops, I'm gonna go back here, sorry. The South Central would be about 20%. So, you know, typically, Markets favor large commercial low cost production that is really close to terminal markets. Um, but I think we have a bit of a legacy of, of where plants have been located and where production current is currently now. Uh, a, a little bit of a disconnect. Um, US wool production. I, I'm just going to mention quickly that I think this graph really demonstrates the or illustrates the the uh, decline in in you know it's attributed to decline in wool use, but it's it's also you know um, wool prices, sheep numbers, and and production wool production, and 
um, the comments that I have seen suggest that any wool market recovery would, would really be um, contingent on an improvement on the Chinese economy. And, and also um, concerns with, with labor shortages. And that's, that seems to be not only in US, but, but that's a kind of a, a, a global situation. Now, shorn wool production in the US during 2021 was 22.5 million, <clears throat> excuse me, million pounds. It was down 3% over, over 2020. Um, sheep and lamb shorn totaled 3.2 million head. That, that was down 2% from 2020. The average price paid for wool sold in 2021 was, was uh, US uh, $1.70 uh, per pound. Um, and that was down 1% from the prior year as well. So thank you for bearing with me to kind of set the scenario on, on a lot of the other um, markets, but it does have bearing on, on what is happening uh, within Canada uh, as well. I, I, um, I'm going to present some of the information in a, in a comparable manner. You know, um, when we look at the inventories, uh, we're basing this off of St Statistics Canada um, surveys from the, the, the one I'm presenting here is from July 1st. Um, census, num or not census, uh, numbers. The, the, um, the national herd has decreased by 14% since, since the, the height uh, of, of, uh, of numbers was in, 20, was, was in 2002, 2002. And <clears throat> there had been a, a number of, of years of, of decline, 2005, 2006, 2007, and 2014. Um, July 1st inventory nationally is 1 million and 77,000 approximately head. Eastern Canada is about 55% of that or, or 590,000 head. And Western Canada is 45% with uh, 486,700 thousand head. Um, so if we look at that in terms of provincial shares, Ontario has, has the majority uh, at 30% of the national herd. And it's followed by Alberta and Quebec, uh, reporting comparable numbers, and then Saskatchewan and Manitoba at 10% at and 9%. Now, if we also look at Census of Canada data, um, you know, the, the 2011, 2016, and 2021, and if we just look at the changes over that, those time periods by province, um, <clears throat> I think we we note in the numbers that Manitoba shows a strong increase in inventory in in 2016 over 20 or 2011. It it it, it was about 27,261 head in 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 the count. Um, and in 2021 over to, uh, 2016. It was an additional 3,660 head. Now, Alberta, we had lower numbers in 2016 versus 2011. Uh, we, were, we were down 7,392 head. It increased to 18,458 head by 2021. 65% um, of, of that increase was in use. And, and to me, that's a, a strong indicator of, of uh, a sector that's in, in kind of a expansion mold. Um, you know, I'd, I'd note that, you know, Manitoba, uh, Ontario, on, Ontario was, was relatively stable um, through that 
2021, 20, over 2016 period. And, and Alberta and, and Manitoba were the two jurisdictions that, that did show uh, increase. Now, these, some of this information is, is, um, and will not be a surprise to you, but the, the imports of lamb and sheep meat product continue to increase. Um, in 2021, it was estimated at $251 million, um, and that was for about approximately 23,000 tons of product. Um, that increase in quantity was about 50% since, since 2012. Um, now, exports were less than 1% of the imports, so <clears throat> we're not a major player in the, in the export sector. In 2020, though, I, I will comment that um, 76.6% of the value of imports were from Australia. Um, there, were, there were five major importers <clears throat> that are listed uh, in that period. And one was from Quebec, two were from Ontario, and two were from Alberta. Slaughter for federally inspected. Um, facilities on a monthly basis from January 20th to um, August of 2022, uh, reported on an east and west basis. Uh, west is includes Ontario <clears throat> for, for reporting reasons. Um, um, CFIA aggregates uh, for confidentiality purposes. And for the East, which is Quebec and the Maritimes. <clears throat> now for 2021 over 2020, um, there was a 1.6% lower slaughter rate in the East and the West was 8.1% lower. And year to date, 2022 over 2021, East is now up 1.3%, but the West is still down slightly. It's at 0.6% at of last year to date, year to date. Now, a, a different picture is looking at the provincial inspected facilities. <clears throat> and some of this will not come as a surprise, but but it, it to me, it, it's, it really warrants consideration. Um, you know, for the Ontario meat complex, um, you know, out of, out of, in 2021, out of 277 and a half thousand head um, that are slaughtered, 81% of the total provincial and federal slaughter is represented by the provincial uh, slaughter capacity. Whereas in Alberta, at, at uh, nearly 21,000 head in 2021, estimates of the total production slaughter in 2021 are, are 124,000.7 head. So we're down 5% there in, from 2020 and, and the provincial represent, represented about 20% <clears throat> of 2021 and about 22.7% of 2020. So, so we see the different, different um, makeup in, in uh, the jurisdictional slaughter capacity. Pricing. Ontario market uses the US market as a benchmark for a lot of its numbers and prices. Um, there's a greater arbitrage between the two. Um, and Ontario normally is a benchmark market for, for the Western pricing. Um, 
So differences between the market should reflect uh, um, a cost of, of shipping, you know, whether it's the freight or insurance or commissions. And, and one thing I'd, I'd like to note is, is that there's a strong correlation. That's why there's such a strong correlation between Ontario and, and Quebec and the other provinces. Um, but we, we'd note that <clears throat> since May, where's my little thing? There we go. Since May, um, you know, there's over the five, over five years, the, the, um, Average spread between Ontario was about $64.31 per hundred weight. And since May, we've noted that there had been a tightening. And as of August, I saw there was actually a reverse relationship. Um, cur currently, it's widened again. Uh, on Ontario is about $252.13 last week for. 80 to 94 pound lamb, whereas Alberta pricing was more in the neighborhood of 238.40, um, but it was up um, from the prior week. Auctions, um, what, what's indicated here is, is kind of the spread between the high and low in auction marts. And that, I think the the, the point that I I felt that this graph kind of portrays is, you know, um, the auction prices. There's there's a lot more volatility in in auction warrants, and and um, they are set to kind of carry their own own uh, momentum in in terms of highs and lows. So it it can really drive. Um, weekly or, or daily prices on, on that basis. Um, they, there may not be the same consistency in buyers from one week to the next or one day to the next. So, so um, you will have a lot more variability show up um, in those types of environments. The, um, over, over the last 10 years, Carcass weights have varied from from you know uh, forty eight point nine pounds in two thousand fourteen to a high of two thousand nineteen of of fifty one point eight pounds um, cold carcass weight um, cold dress weight sorry the the that may look like a lot of variability but. You know, as as we just indicated earlier, last last year in the U.S. there was an eight pound carcass weight difference. So, um, you know, it's it's it still has uh, some strong consistency. Um, one other uh, one other area that we look to quite often is, is cold storage because it's, it's part of the whole supply chain. Um, and I think what, what we see is that, yes, it has been increasing over the time period. And there is a lot of variability again, but, but it's, it serves as a tool to quite often help with, with seasonality. Um, the the one thing to consider though is is that um, sheep meat does not have the same frozen life as some of the other red meats. So so um, we we monitor some of those numbers to in, to ensure that we're not running into a, a situation of um, lost product. <laughs> but we. We can note that um, processors, especially in the lamb sector, had been opened more consistently. Um, and quite often, um, consumers who are faced with higher prices uh, and maybe purchasing less, um, that can result in, in driving some of the cold storage components up. Now, I think this goes without saying, but I, I, I feel that 
you know, in any discussion of pricing. When we look at, at lamb prices um, from January 2018, there for Alberta, there was an increase of about 31.7% over the period. Um, but over that same period, feed barley prices increased 123.7%. And, and uh, good hay as a farm input price is, is reported to have increased by 47.2%. So um, I, think, I think the, the prices have increased, but there's also been pressure on profitability. Now, wool, Canadian wool um, uh, information, uh, according to the Canadian Cooperative Wool Growers, um, indicates that 2022 continues to struggle in Canada. Um, they attributed this to the COVID-19 and to global trade uh, disruptions. Um, the the there is hope that um, as shipping logistics had started to show improvement that some of these conditions would improve. Um, now, <clears throat> the volume of raw wool decreased in, in 2020 uh, by 21.5% over 2019. The average price for wool um, to Canadian producers was 69 cents per kilo, and that decreased by 21.6% from the prior year. Um, total farm value was reported at 648,000, and this was down 37.9% from 2019. And this, this is data that's coming from Statistics Canada. So where, where does this lead us? What, 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 what is there that, that we can take away from this information? You know, going forward, um, yes, spring lamb prices are the market high point. So we do see the, the critical celebrations coming up that have, always had a strong impact on demand. Um, and we see demographics within Alberta um, in terms of the populations of Christian, Muslim, Sikh, Jewish, um, um, having a, a strong, being a strong opportunity. We also have the forecasts that you know that just suggests that consumers are reducing consumption and and price is flattening. Um, the the lamb prices in twenty twenty one were at record, um, and it, according to the U S USDA information, um, they're forecasting a you know a slight increase within you know for for 2023 but but um, they'll still be in the range of of uh, 120 to 145 uh, dollars per hundred weight and again the the livestock market information center has forecasted the January 2023 inventories to be down. Um, you know, we, the, these forecasts um, also depend on, on the producer's ability to, to kind of rebuild um, from the drought pressures and, and be able to, to uh, um, Con, you know, constrain and, and remain um, positive, you know, work through the availability of the feed and forage. Um, 
supplies. So the picture has been one of kind of a, a declining demand, um, global pressures, uh, especially in the feed grain component. Um, we see China still a major player uh, influencing global markets. And given that Ontario follows US markets and, and Alberta, um, is in a situation that, that it doesn't have the Ontario provincial slaughter base, which as as a as its strength. Um, we also see lamb consumption is is low compared to other meats, and and consumers are culturally and ethnically distinct, um, and there are a lot of other factors, risk factors like disease and predators that you're dealing with that, that impact costs and profits. Um, there are tools that, that you have been using, you know, uh, to, to help kind of carefully pen, pencil out your business scenarios. There, there's potentially uh, ways of either if you can't can't uh, prevent, um, you know, an an incident, um, maybe you can alter the impact, and and that may come in the form of of insurances like the business risk management programs, or or diversification, or looking to contingency um, or or cash reserves, um, and one comes to mind as the agri invest program. Um, potentially, these are avenues that that can help mitigate some of the risks. Um, but where I would like to leave today's discussion is more on kind of having an exchange of seeing what you see as the major issues facing your industry. Is it is it truly the the prolonged pandemic? And, and slow economic recovery, or or is it more the uh, profitability aspects, or or the the market situation that you're faced with in terms of the concentration of of whether it be the processing sector, um, and <clears throat> as well any of any what what you're doing to to anticipate or navigate through any future events. Um, so I'd, I'd leave these three questions with you and, and possibly open it up for discussion. Um, yeah, thank you very much for your time. Ashley? Yes. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, I just say thank you so much, Anne. Um, I will open it up to our participants on the call this evening if there's any questions. Um, feel free to put them in the chat box, or you can also unmute yourself to ask the questions to Anne. I, I see there's a message or a question here that says, who can see your messages recording? Oh, okay. I don't see anything in the chat box. It was just me when I had put it in. Oh, I see. Just testing. Okay. Yeah. Um, what, I'd, what I'd like to to um add is you know my email address is is ann.boyda at gov.ab.ca i know i've thrown a lot of data a lot of information uh i i am assuming that a lot of this is is has been shared in the past uh, and and maybe a little bit more updated since since there may have been a last presentation but i encourage discussion or, or any questions to, to be sent directly to me. I'd appreciate it. And, and any perspectives you have, any of your insights, I mean, you're, you're in the business, you know the challenges you're facing. I, I would like to, to kind of uh, get a bit of your perspectives on, on how you see the future impacting your business. There is a question, I think, from Ryan. Ryan, do you want to unmute yourself? 
Yeah, sure. Thank you, Ashley. First of all, thanks ALP for putting this on and for presenting today. I'm curious, when you look at uh, Ontario and their provincial capacity for, for slaughter, uh, is the Alberta government looking at moving along or working harder at the interprovincial trade and then opening up potential growth for our provincial plants in that regard in terms of um, interprovincial meat movement, not necessarily export? Um, just curious your thoughts regional, on that. More on a regional basis. Um, and the answer is yes, there, there is, there is a, and I'm, the name escapes me, there, there is a, um, kind of a, fed, pro, a federal provincial uh, group that are looking at um, a couple of locations specifically as pilots to test uh, interprovincial movement aspects. Um, and looking at, at standard that are required uh, from, from the federal level and the provincial level. Um, one of the locations is uh, Lloyd Minster. The other, there is one I think uh, between, and I, I apologize, you know, I, I, I will ask you to send me a, a, an email and I can, I can give you a little more detail on the project itself. Um, but it's just getting launched, and and the whole intent is to look at the impacts of facilitating some of that trade. I mean, the the comments that have come to government, um, uh, you know, especially in a location like Lloyd Minister, where you know you, you could be a walk across the street and you're in a different province, right? Uh, I think I think that's that's a consideration that's given. How, how they can expand some of that regional component. Appreciate that, Anne. I will reach out and I'm definitely curious on these pilots. It, it's exactly to your point. It's uh, crazy to think that we can feed our neighbors, but we can't feed our neighbors if they're five mm -hmm. miles outside of the, and, the province and, and federal requirements are just... Um, too restrictive to be able to meet in terms of... of it's possible uh, to catch a federal plant um, without a, a considerable amount of capacity and contracts, so thank and, you. And there are three pilots, one of which is in, in Alberta. So th that's why I know about the Alberta one. <laughs> so yes, please send me, um, and, and we, can, we can share the information with Ashley if there's greater interest as well. Um, um, I actually have, I just found out a little while ago about these pilot projects. Um, and it was back from, I think, July 21st when the FPT agriculture ministers confirmed the importance of reducing the barriers to interprovincial trade and welcomed the four pilot project that were going to be focused on domestic trade in border regions and ready to grow plants. And so, as Anne did mention, there is one of the four projects involves Alberta and Saskatchewan. So the CFIA, Alberta and Saskatchewan identified there to be a pilot to ease the unique challenges associated with the movement of food within the city of Lloydminster. It started or is supposed to be launching this month. Um, the Lloydminster Chamber of Commerce is playing a role in engaging with the food businesses and other stakeholders. Um, so I, I am aware, um, I haven't heard much since then, but um, and if you have anything more that's up to date, I'd be more than happy for if you share. You know, uh, I I will certainly certainly ask some questions and send you any in the information in the next mm -hmm. week or so. Is that fair, Ashley? And and Ryan, please please still send your note as a reminder, and I'll get it to you directly. Will do. Thank you, Ashley. And yeah, I, I, along the lines of what Garrett's asking, um, I think that instead of looking at our only federal plant closing as a as a huge risk to our industry, I think our government should be looking at it as a huge opportunity to, to leverage some of our provincial plants or, or other people being able to jump into the, to the market and, and help our producers move meat across our country that is already at an export deficit. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, Very well put. There were two questions that did come in through the chat box that I think Ryan was referring to Garrett's comment, but I'm just going to go back up to, to Simon's. Um, he said, how come as a country that is importing lamb, our market prices fluctuate as aggressively as exporting markets? Wouldn't this make more local grown lamb more valuable? 
Um, okay, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find my chat, so I apologize for, for, for the lack of the by slow response i couldn't can't see my questions here but what i what i'd what i'd like to to say is um it it all rests on you know the the imports coming in as uh, from a low cost production base um the value wise um and putting pressure on our pricing Does that answer the question for you, Simon? Oh, not hearing or seeing. Yeah. Sorry, there we go. I was trying to unmute there. <clears throat> um, yeah, I, I guess that would. But what, so what you're saying is that that uh, is um, potentially more affordable for an uh, Australian farmer to raise it and then ship it across mm -hmm. it'll come in under our cost of production. Yes, I think I think um, there was some information, you know, there's a group called the Agri Benchmark Network that that do um, benchmarking comparisons across different different countries. And, and I will pull that information, Simon, if if you send me a note. Um, and I'll send it to Ashley as well. Uh, she probably has it, maybe. Um, and it it has a, a country by country comparison of some of the cost of production, okay. and, and and where we sit. Um, so it it it's you know it it's um, not necessarily service or survey based. I I would term it as as information that's more like a focus group gathered from each of the countries, uh, you know, um, not a actual cost, but I think it's still reflective when it's compared across region by region. I see. Is there any kind of um, from government uh, looking into this sort of thing where as an uh, industry that is starting to grow or mm. and then has a harder or it has to get developed, it will be way harder to compete with uh, these other countries. So is their government um, willing to stand up and, and really support the industry or? Well, I, I, I not, you know, we, there's kind of a catch 22 there uh, in terms of how government supports. Um, there, there has to be um, caution because anytime government provides direct assistance in some areas, it's it could be construed as as um, subsidy, mm. and then becomes countervailable, and that doesn't that what happens there? I don't I don't claim to understand the complexity, but some countries can claim countervailable uh, charges. On, on some commodities and, and impact retaliate on others, so, so to speak. So, so the programs that are typically offered, whether they be agri-stability or agri-recovery, when there's an event or something, are always checked against whether or not other governments, and here it's primarily US, uh, would, would um, charge charge us with countervail uh available uh, availability okay. aspects yes no, so, that, that makes sense so, it's, not so the it, in, uh... it, it's not that there that there isn't assistance it's just which programs can provide it um and i think i think a lot of that are is is how the agri stability was designed so that if if um, there's variability in your margins, your your income, um, your farm income, then then you can uh, recover a component of it. So that that helps you kind of um, charge through that variability of over time a bit easier. 
Um, so, so are they looking to help? They most certainly want to. And, um, and in terms of understanding where industry is in terms of their costs of production, I think producers have a fairly good concept of their own, but how they compare to, to others in terms of, of you know, a province or another jurisdiction, um, that, that generally um, is undertaken in a cost of production study. Okay. Um, and the government does provide those as well. Um, so Ashley, if if you and your board are are interested, we could get you some information there as well. Ashley, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, what was that? It was what studies? And oh, um, for cost of production. Oh, okay. You know, I know we've we've kind of looked at that before. They they there are other sectors that that um, are, you know, there's a, a program called Agri Profits that uh, producers submit information, they get, they get their own analyses, but there's also provincial averages that come out of the, the exercise for comparison. So I'm, I'm, I'm selling other departments and, or other aspects within my department, but market analysis is important too. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just teasing. Yeah. Um, there's another question too, Anne. Um, it came from Garrett. So Garrett, if we need some more clarity, I can get you to unmute yourself. But his question, Anne says, am I missing some information on the current market situation caused by the financial difficulties of the North American Lamb Company? This currently affects many of us producers at this time. And, you know, unfortunately, I don't have any more information than what what is what um, is currently public information. Um, you know, the, the, as far as I understand, the bidding process that's being um, um, overseen by Ernst & Young um, closed the end of October. Um, I, th I would presume they're going through uh, a bit more of a, this would be my terminology, a due diligence of, of, of the offers. Um, and my understanding is that there should be announcement before the end of December. I think I, what I see is positive is, is um, there, there are offers. So it's, it, you know, it's, it's a good sign in my perspective. I, I'm hoping that provides a little bit more confidence in, in the industry because, um, it, it is a very serious question. Yes, sorry. You were going to say, I, Ashley, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think, um, and maybe Garrett, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I know like I did share that information with producers. What I think he might've been getting at was considering what's been going on with NELC that's been taking place since, I think it was around like the beginning of August um, of having that shown somehow in, the market report like when we're looking at some of our current pricing we're trending oh i see okay yeah yes although, Garrett, is you know part, part part of the part of the difficulty there is is the the they're conducting business as usual um and and it's a very short time period that we have like from basically i think it was august 8th or so when the announcement came out to to current but we could most definitely take a closer look at exactly uh what's transpired in that period is that what is ashley is that what you're asking uh i'm gonna get garrett to unmute himself because it was his question so i don't want to okay and i apologize i can't see the chat thing i, I had it up before it popped up but <laughs> Garrick, do you want to just unmute yourself to speak? Just to make sure that Inter I've interpreted that properly. Oh, here's the chat. Okay. Yeah. And kind of same for me, because maybe I was wrong. Okay. Um, 
Yes, you know, I I think I think there there are two aspects that I would comment to there. You know, one being, yes, the downturn has been experienced or both or in the states globally, in in Ontario and Alberta as well. What 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 I did note in the last last. Um, short term was a bit of an inverse in the relationship between Ontario and Alberta, uh, where the Alberta price had actually uh, been higher for a week there. Um, and and that and and it spread out again. So I I I unfortunately had only monthly information up. So what I'll do is I'll take a closer look. Uh, at the data that I can get uh, probably on a weekly basis and see if what's happening with that relationship, Garrett. Is that what you're referring to? I see he's not unmuting himself and he's not. It could not... be his system not, not. Uh, yeah. but, but yes, uh, and again, I would ask, um, that that they you know if there's any specific questions like like that um, that they send me an email and I'll see what I can pull up in data because because that's you know I, I, a lot of those relationships I can't speak uh, from the top of my head because I have to actually <laughs> verify the information um, and I'll see see you Ashley if there's anything of interest that you want to share further. Mm -hmm. Oh, he says he doesn't have a mic on that that computer. No problem. Okay. Uh, just just send me an email for for any further clarification, and we can try uh, uh, follow through with with more information. There's another question too, and that came through from Eric. Uh, it says, "I have been told that the North American Lamb Company is dumping their breeding stock into the meat market, causing low prices. Can you verify this?" We can look into uh, what information we have data wise. Um, in, and when you say into the meat market, um, you're you're not your breeding stock into the meat market. So you're saying that they're they're mature sheep um, um, and that has lowered the price. the that that would have a, an impact on, on that category of, of um, carcass, but um, there, there, there should be a price being reported on the um, market lamb as well. So I'll see if, if, if that information is available. Um, Eric? Can you hear me? Oh, yes. hi, Eric. Yes, am, am, am I interpreting your question right? You're, you're, you're suggesting that that breeding stock has gone in for slaughter and, and as a consequence, bringing down all the meat price. Um, yes, and as I, as I would understand, it's not only older ewes; it's it's all their ewe lambs as well, which would usually go into their, um, oh, into their in, breeding into program. The, which so it, it's the a replacement, the replacement lambs, you're saying? Re yes. Okay. You know, I don't know if I'm going to be able to pull that out to tell you the truth, um, but I will, I will see what I can do, what, what information there is. Um, okay. But there just might not be the data being reported at that, at that level for me to be able to say, because a lot of the data, especially uh, it through St Statistics Canada or CFIA is aggregated. <clears throat> and because this is our only federal inspected facility, it, it, it may end up getting lumped into some of the Ontario um, federally inspected data too. So let me, let me just, you know, I, I, I need to take a closer look, Eric, sorry. <laughs> okay. 
And Garrett did respond with another comment. He said, I understand that Sun Gold didn't purchase private lambs for some time and more lambs needed to be exported to Ontario. Is that right? Okay, interprovincial movement is is um, more difficult to to track. Um, I don't know if it's right or not. Purchase private lands for some time. I don't, I, you know, I, I'll look at, at what information is, is reported in terms of interprovincial movement, and that might be the only place that we can see, um, you know, if, if there have, have been, um, if, if there's been movement in that period. Is it fair to say, Anne, like I know that there are a bunch of questions um, at the top of mind for our producers with everything that's going on right now with the federal processing plant here in Alberta, um, but could it be, it's going to be very hard to support with data. Like, I don't want to say exactly. No, exactly. You know, you have these thoughts, but it's very challenging to pull and, the data that would actually support and, that, not from yeah. not wanting to have it. And it, it, it'll be difficult to validate if it's a rumor or not, um, not unless there's actual sales information. Um, so, but, you know, the, I can look at the questions and I can, I can try and see if there is data. Um, available and that's about the best I can do Ashley sorry yeah, no that's that's more than okay and maybe to like if it helps and if you do find some of this data um, and want to circulate it back if you want to kind of share that with me in an email I'm more than happy to um, forward it along to all of the registrants for tonight's session that way they have access um, mm -hmm. to the info and then they don't have to email that one-on-one -on -one. If that makes okay. it easier, sure, sure. If you give me a list of questions, I could I could follow through on on what information that is is available. Um, Are there any other questions for Anne? Again, she did mention if you don't have any questions that come to mind right now, you can always send her the email, um, and she can pull that information together for you. Do one last call for any questions. All right, I don't see and, any more. And and thank you so much for for giving us the opportunity to present. I I know that there was a lot of data, um, but you know because you have the if 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 there's a different format that works better for you, let me know and. Uh, We'll try. I know. I know. In your newsletter, we try and give a bit of a summary of some of this as well. So that would be another source, and 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 your website provides a lot of information as well, Ashley. So producers producers um, can can have a number of resources to to turn to. Mm -hmm. And so before I go um, and close the webinar for tonight. Um, if there are any suggestions, again, um, on you know a different way to present, if there was something that you were looking for for when um, we have this presentation again next year, because we are hoping to host it annually on top of having our reports in our newsletter, um, please send that to myself and let me know. Um, and if you have any other questions for Anne, you can feel free to email them to her directly, or you can also send them to me and I can send those off to Anne. Um, but with that, I will say thank you very much, Anne, um, and to all of our participants this evening who joined us. This will conclude the webinar. I will be sending an email to everyone who registered for this evening's session that will include a link to where you can access the webinar recording. Okay.